So it is my incredible pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Lisa White, who is now the Director of Education and Outreach at the Museum of Paleontology at UC Berkeley. Um, but before that, she has had a long and really fantastic career. Um, she was uh, all the way up to Associate Dean at San Francisco State University, um, where she was, you got your undergraduate degree there, and then came back and went from assistant professor all the way through to Associate Dean and <laughs> professor. So that, that's pretty impressive. Um, and Lisa got her PhD at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I have known of her for a long time in many different contexts, but also for her some of her Miocene research and her, yes, and her connections with a good friend of mine from Santa Cruz. And actually the first time that I met Lisa, we were invited to a Zoom that turned out to be my favorite pandemic Zoom of the of 2000 because we were invited to try to figure out how to um, convince a textbook author that um, putting up a dude wall, so a wall of old white guys in a figure um, in an oceanography textbook that was coming up probably wasn't the best thing for the field or the students who are going to be reading the book. And so we developed a strategy that I think was successful and we have moved on from there. And so I'm really excited to have Lisa join us. Lisa does a lot of different things. Um, she is also, you're the chair of the, what are they calling it? The Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee at AGU. At AGU, yes I am. And you are a fellow of GSA, which is super exciting. And also of the California Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. And um, Lisa has done a lot of great work. She's done some really, really interesting um, writing recently, including one with um, Robin Bell in 2020 called The Geosciences, Geosciences Community Needs to Be More Diverse and Inclusive. And that's in Scientific American. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Amelia, for that wonderful introduction. And everyone, I'm just going to get ready to share my slides here. Uh, and thank you for welcoming me. Uh, let me see. Where are my slides? All right. So can you all see these? Yes, thumbs up. OK, fantastic. Let me just get my little laser pointer here. OK, this is going to be so fun. Um, I will let you know um, from the start, uh, you are more than welcome to take screen grab, screen capture, uh, any of my slides. I have some QR codes uh, on uh, some of the slides later on in the talk. So if you're curious about some of the resources that I highlight, there'll be a number of URLs uh, on the slide. So take full advantage. And I know we're recording uh, to be posted to your YouTube channel. Uh, but, you know, I, I work in science communication and public outreach and love to share my work with others. So do feel free um, to uh, capture anything you'd like uh, that I share and also to contact me, you know, after the talk, if I can highlight more about these programs. But with some of the icons that are on this opening slide, uh, they'll be part of the programs that I share uh, during my talk with you. And I, uh, I shared with the graduate students earlier. I have always tended to do a little too much, you know, as a professional, but everything uh, is interrelated in a way that I think really supports the broad effort to engage people in geoscience, to welcome new generations to our discipline, uh, and to really prioritize um, the way that it that we do, uh, that we do our science and we share our science. So. Uh, those things will all be be part of the talk here. 
Okay, so um, in this overview, you know, I, I want to, from the start, just uh, talk about what it really means to be involved in geoscience in a way that uh, highlights and expands equity, diversity, and inclusion. And yes, there are a number of acronyms we use these days. There's JEDI, and if that's not enough, now there's BE JEDI or BE a JEDI. So it's it's really more than uh, just you know trying to increase the numbers of underrepresented individuals in our discipline, uh, and it's more about uh, increasing the way uh, that we invite people to really become part of the science. Uh, in ways that shift the culture, because we really can't keep doing things the same old way that we've done from our field work to our cruises, to what we're doing in the classroom and expect that uh, we're gonna bring, you know, a different generation of, of scientists that, that look a lot different. So, you know, we wanna just be mindful of what it really means to be a Jedi. So I wanna share that along with my own background and training and, and really what's led me to devote a large part of my career now um, to changing that culture, inspiring the next generation and and working with faculty and graduate students to really rethink, you know, how it is that we do and share our science. And, you know, as Amelia mentioned, I had a long career as a faculty member and an administrator at San Francisco State. And those were great years there. But when the opportunity came to work at the Museum of Paleontology at UC Berkeley, uh, it was a, a a total direction that I embraced uh, to really focus on um, using a museum platform to share science in a way that excites others. So I'm really looking forward to sharing uh, those experiences and highlighting ways that we can increase uh, accessibility and really JEDI and geoscience with the way that we shape uh, resources and share them, particularly when it comes to fossil collections. Uh, and I've really enjoyed this work uh, because of the graduate students that I work with uh, at the museum at Berkeley and also at other institutions that are very much interested um, in leadership training. So I'll, uh, as the talk goes on, highlight specifically just what some of these resources are um, and ways that since I've been the director uh, of education, uh, really try to infuse more interactivity uh, in our resources and the things that we do so that we can engage again uh, whole new groups of, of people uh, in ways that really excite uh, these groups. Uh, and one of the newest projects that I'll highlight uh, called Access Paleo or Advancing Community College Education um, and for Student Success involves partnerships with community colleges. So that will be part of the talk as well. And, you know, I'm often asked and I do like to ask others, you know, why are we we doing this work and why lead? And, and I think it's OK to keep asking, you know, why this work is important and what are some ways that we can do this in a direction that, you know, fully embraces the need to uh, to include, you know, diverse voices in what we do. And, you know, in these three points just justify a, a lot of this work. When we think of what's really required for 21st century science and really the need to operate at full capacity, given the challenges of our time, uh, you can't expect this, you know, full engagement if we're not truly engaging all qualified minds. And, you know, as we've seen, and I've certainly witnessed firsthand in all the years I've been working broadly on these issues, is individuals who are part of our community or seek to be part of the community and the workforce, you know, they can't operate at full capacity if they're constantly being burdened by racism, discrimination in the forms of microaggressions and people's biases and, you know, these preconceived notions about who can be a scientist. And if we're truly, again, to embrace the need to operate at full capacity, um, include all the kinds of individuals that we need at a time when we are facing all these uh, problems on deck, then we have to admit and work towards solutions that support, you know, all hands really being 
on deck. So I ask you to be mindful of these things as I talk more about my work. Now, as Amelia mentioned, uh, my research training um, is in micropaleontology and also in paleoceanography and, and geology. Uh, my graduate work at UC Santa Cruz focused on fossil diatoms. So here's a Miocene-centric diatom there. I've worked in diatomite quarries that we find in the Monterey Formation in California, but I've also worked on the altered or diagenetic products of diatomites, including cherts and the interspersed rocks of other compositions that are important to dating uh, rocks that can be really altered. Uh, so in my career, I've worked on on-land sections. I've participated in a couple of IODP cruises as a shipboard scientist. And I show this image um, in the lower part of the slide because What's been exciting now is I've transitioned and fully embraced being a professional whose focus is education and outreach is now I'm partnering with IODP uh, to bring educators and graduate students who are interested in broader impacts and diversity in science uh, to join us on cruises called School of Rock, not a very original name, but it's the opportunities when the Joides resolution is between major expeditions and maybe transiting between ports uh, or uh, at a tie up at a port call, then we're able to do these uh, courses uh, on the ship, oceanography courses at sea. And I really in my training that's very much rooted in, in geology as well as, as paleontology and oceanography, I've really tried to prioritize education and outreach in a way that gets people to the places where we collect data. And, you know, clearly during the pandemic, it was more difficult to run these kinds of programs. And we're really continuing to question what um, or the value. It's sort of continuing to run the classic, you know, field camps or or ship work in the same ways that we've always done it. And, you know, those are separate conversations that are part of this rethinking about the culture of geoscience. But I show this slide because the year that I became department chair of geosciences at San Francisco State was also the year that I received uh, my first multi-year NSF grant focused on education, outreach, and diversity in geoscience. So the program was called SF Rocks, so reaching out to communities and kids with science in San Francisco. So initially, the science experiences for high school students in the Bay Area were focused on the geology of San Francisco and surrounds, but uh, through the years, uh, we were able to partner with other universities and take the students out uh, to national parks in the West and uh, really inspire them to want to learn more about geoscience uh, because of these awesome settings. So, you know, you want to blow the minds, right, of people initially and then use that as an entry uh, to geoscience. So I've taken just a, you know, a lot of those approaches in education and outreach and uh, expanding uh, inclusion and equity in geoscience uh, to partner with the research infrastructure that is so possible in our discipline to get uh, students, teachers, early career scientists out uh, to the places where it is that we um, do our primary data collection. And so, as I mentioned, um, the partnership with IODP that includes time on the Joides resolution, uh, but also partnerships with vessels in the UNOS fleet uh, means that we've been able to uh, take groups out you know, when ships are transiting and really uh, engage um, these audiences in science research firsthand. And so we'll re be returning uh, to some of these opportunities uh, very soon but ambassadors for STEM training to enhance participation A step uh, is just one of these opportunities that uh, I wanted to share with all of you. And uh, two years ago, when we were able uh, to take students out um, on this vessel, uh, we had the Alvin on board. And so uh, more, what better way you know, to blow a student's mind uh, than to show them the kinds of uh, tools and technology you know, that we have to do this work. So uh, 
Let me um, also share a bit about what I think continues to be challenging with how we prepare uh, future Earth and ocean scientists. And I do it all the time. Look, I just started this talk uh, with those images of going great places and you know blowing minds with all the terrific areas in which we get to work. And our um, brochures are filled with those sorts of um, of opportunities, right? You know, pictures just like this that show a tropical beach, a place wouldn't you want to be there, you know, come with us and your life will never be the same. And this is how, you know, we do it in, in our discipline. This is how we do our research. So that's what we sell. But honestly, you know, the experience of some students is the total opposite from that. And I'd like to think we're working um, at a time where we can just be more mindful of the image that we project in earth and ocean science is often not the experience that you know truly happens when students who may not have ever been as connected with earth and ocean science um, as we all are come out with us you know on these research experiences and that you know, maybe we need to rethink sometimes not only the way that we sell our discipline, but what the actual expectations are um, when we go out so that it's not a nightmare. And uh, the source of this slide, so Brandon Jones is a program officer uh, in the Geosciences Directorate at NSF. And he often talks about the problem with culture um, in earth and ocean science where we're just assuming the the problem is the student. You know, it's this classic kind of deficit model attitude where you're assuming the student is deficient. You know, they didn't have the right kinds of science programs in high school. They never went camping. You know, they've never been out on a boat. And we don't stop to think that, you know, maybe it's the environment that we're putting this poor student in that is toxic. You know, don't try to fix the fish or the student. You know, maybe as he says in the vernacular, the water's nasty. You know, maybe there was just something wrong with the departmental culture that has us continually showing up, you know, on the low end of the diversity metrics when it comes to who's participating in our science. So it's high time, you know, we consider changing the system in which we place people in um, and not uh, changing and, and fixing them. So keep those things in mind as we reflect on just everything that happened this past year and a half where there truly were these undeniable forces demanding change. Uh, we had the pandemic within the pandemic, uh, the reawakening you know, of social justice in uh, the US that just really demanded that you know, we rethink um, how it is that we just continue to live with racism and injustice uh, and don't seem to honestly, you know, try to be changing anything. And so these call to action from uh, BIPOC uh, communities, from black indigenous uh, people of color and our allies uh, really demanded that we try to change the system and stop trying to change the people that we say, you know, we want to invite and include. And I think this year and a half has pre presented uh, really special and unique challenges for us uh, in STEM disciplines, and especially in disciplines that include uh, investigating climate change and environmental change. And there is no way that we can tackle, you know, the kinds of problems that we face now without including more individuals in the workforce. So. For folks like me that have been part of, you know, diversity programs in science my whole career, I certainly welcomed this reattention um, to this, this investment and this awakening, if you would, that made more people a step to the table than I ever thought would be involved in a diversity discussion. And I'm sure a number of you uh, saw and witness and remember and hopefully are involved in some of these efforts. There were the petitions to uh, calls to action for robust anti-racism plans. As Amelia mentioned, I did publish in my role as the chair of the Diversity Inclusion Committee at AGU just a number of articles on 
why diversity matters, not only to AGU, but to our communities in general, our community of, of geoscientists. Uh, a number of you are probably familiar with Unlearning Racism in Geoscience, so the URGE project that's NSF funded, and there were numerous URGE pods throughout the country at universities and science institutions to uh, really examine, you know, uh, what is the unfortunate history of racism in the states and what are some ways that we can correct action. Lots of articles over this last year and a half published on field work, um, not only the challenges of field work during the pandemic, but questioning uh, why th we are having these expectations of doing things always the same way and all of the individuals that we continue to exclude uh, because of that. So those served uh, for a lot of inspirational moments during the past year and a half. And, and this fall with you know, many of us in our institutions returning more to in-person instruction and the ongoing demands on everyone's time, you know, there is some worry that folks have moved on or will moved on and aren't as invested you know, in anti-racism plans. But this was an article published um, just this summer by Hindrata Ali and others. And Hindrata led one of the major petitions that called geoscientists to action. So with this publication and others now, uh, they're really trying to give us all the tools. You know, what do we do next? How do we sustain this momentum? How do we really enact change in a systematic way that makes a difference? in the places where we work and where we teach and learn. And so with uh, this article, and I especially like this figure that um, is a is one of the figures in this article, because you know it's one thing to say, okay, we'll be more mindful of one's identity and uh, you know value and respect diversity in others, diversity of opinions, diversity of, uh, ethnic and gender identity groups, but but how do you how do you enact this? What does it mean to recognize identity? And so acknowledging racism and intersectionality. And if we're to embrace a range of values, then we need to be transparent and accountable. If we say, oh, we're going to pro provide access in our programs, but what that really means, if you intend to take this seriously, is you need to remove barriers to opportunities. And we spout words like inclusion, but to put this into action, you really do have to embrace and accommodate all members. And if we're to be truly equitable, then we need to address the racist and discriminatory history um, in, in our past and certainly in our discipline. And for true justice uh, within the sciences, then really tackling the colonial approaches that we have to science and parachute science, which is the practice of you know, just going to a country to collect information and you, you have no intention of working closely with any scientists there or even finding out, you know, what the interests are of scientists that may be in that country or in that particular area, which might be a region of the U.S. So you just parachute in, you know, get your samples with your own scientific team and get out and never even do something with that group. So, you know, give, given that, given our knowledge and hopefully increased level of sophistication about how to really shape programs that are truly diverse and inclusive, then I think that guide, that figure that I showed from that publication is a really good start. And this slide, as I transition to talking more specifically about some of the programs I'm involved with, um, or just a way that I've tried to really apply some of those principles as well, that includes you know, working with the research infrastructure that surrounds us. So I'm continuing to work with IODP on a series, not only of ship-based workshops for educators, but what we call impact workshops that are for professionals, um, ocean science professionals who are interested in broadening participation in utilizing the products that have resulted from all of this great history of ocean science research, but using them in a way that um, helps us bridge understanding with um, the public on what science is. And I've been involved in crafting what we call vision and change in geoscience. There was a publication last year um, that went live that I was a part of 
that really asks questions about what does the 21st century degree look like um, in geoscience? How are we preparing our students for the challenges? What sort of skills and competencies uh, should they have? You know, working with data, visualizing um, different kinds of phenomenon, being able to write um, and speak in a way that general audiences can explain. And so I've just tried to keep my hands in the ocean science world and the paleontology, broader impacts community with our access program. Uh, the Museum of Paleontology at Berkeley is closely aligned with integrative biology at Cal. And so I tried to really up my game when it comes to um, following what's going on in uh, the biodiversity literacy community when it comes to undergraduate education in biology. And HU has some great new projects that are really about building leadership in um, geoscience. But I mentioned all of those opportunities to say that um, there, we really are at a time where it's um, impossible to ignore, you know, the need to approach uh, inclusion differently. And there are a range of opportunities and ways to be involved. So even if it might not make sense, you know, in your individual lab to, you know, start a whole new program, you know, with a different kind of community, there are ways to hook in to many things that are going on in the professional uh, science um, organizations and also um, broadly within networks that of folks that really seek to um, to do this kind of work. And I mentioned this as I opened my talk that uh, it's fine to to ask often, you know, why do the work in justice, equity, diversity and inclusion, you know, how do we take those next steps? Um, you know, how do we use those calls to action to drive new resources and programs? And at the heart of all of this is work that includes more and a greater diversity in, of individuals is great for the entire STEM enterprise, and, and we all really benefit. Okay, so let's get to the specifics of uh, what are some of these programs that I run at the UCMP and how um, am I just trying to reshape my own approach, even as a person long time committed to work in JEDI, uh, I think we all um, continually uh, learn um, ways of being more effective and bringing more, more partnerships on board. So uh, let me start with our websites. Um, we, um, we recently celebrated uh, 25 years on the web, and I know it's hard to think of a time, you know, especially this generation of students, uh, when the web wasn't central to how we gathered information um, and how we taught and learned. But when the web was in its infancy um, in the early 90s, the UCMP was one of the first websites really anywhere in the world, the first 100 websites uh, included the UCMP website. And I was on the advisory board. I was at San Francisco State then, but a total fan um, of the UCMP website. And then later was on the advisory board for uh, some particular parts of the website. Uh, but we haven't lost sight of the power to share information in this format uh, with broader audiences. And uh, so I was anxious and excited, you know, to be able to guide uh, new content and features that we offer virtually uh, and uh, embrace these eager graduate students associated with the museum that uh, are also excited to do this work. But also, but given my nature, you know, just very tactile, used to field programs and getting people out and about, and so I just wanted to be sure that, you know, we're extending all of the great content that we offer on our sites to other kinds of programs, whether they involve communities associated with, you know, the, sh the ship community or others or the paleo world, then let's just, again, the all hands on deck sort of thing. But I'm showing the slide um, to remember to tell you that we uh, are although we are primarily a research museum and we don't have a big public footprint uh, on the Berkeley campus, although we do have a beautiful lobby in the Valley Life Sciences building, if you're ever on the Berkeley campus and got a T-Rex here. And, and we have fossil, we have more than 5 million 
specimens. That includes about a million microfossils, by the way. And they're stored all over in our main museum, which is behind uh, these glass doors, but also in the Campanile, our, our bell tower, when the Campanile was initially constructed in the early 1900s. Um, we had and still do uh, big numbers of samples from the La Brea tar pits in Southern California. And as they were cleaning them and preparing them, uh, they smell bad, frankly, and so they needed a place to store them. So the uh, middle floors of the Campanile include fossils from there. Uh, we have lots of opportunities for students at Berkeley to intern with us to help with sample preparation and cataloging. And so that's been really central to our mission. And so in addition to all of the virtual work that we do that I'll share, there's still people behind um, all of this work. Now, um, one of the sites after the, the UCMP main website launched in the early, um, uh, early 1990s, uh, then as the 2000s were approaching, uh, there was a lot of focus by the education outreach community at Berkeley at that time. So this predated me, but I was on the advisory boards uh, for uh, this project when it initially launched. But the thinking here was, you know, let's just let's just go ahead and take on the big and important issues uh, of our time and lending just all the weight of Berkeley's science scientists and know how to share uh, thinking and understanding about evolution. And so this continues to be one of the most popular parts of our website. It's just receives more than a million page views uh, every month, um, particularly. Uh, during at the beginning of the school year. We recently uh, received a new grant to refurbish this site. Uh, so it'll have a new look very soon and uh, some new and more sophisticated search features. But one of the things that I really prioritize since I've been director is bringing more of this information, whether it be in evolution or nature and process of science or global change to audiences. And so we were recently funded with the National Institutes of Health grant uh, to build a pop-up uh, museum. So the structure that you see here uh, will be a fully inflatable and deflatable uh, trailer looking uh, structure about 30 feet in length. And inside uh, this trailer, by the way, this is the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco and Golden Gate Park. This is one of their halls. So this mock-up is what the trailer will look like. Uh, when um, it's finished, which will be about a year from now. But we're really trying a whole different approach for us, which is designing a escape room style game uh, that one will be challenged to play when they enter the escape room. And it's about evolutionary relationships in science. So we'll have all kind of different props, you know, understanding phylogenetic um, relationships and the big biomedical mystery that we're asking, uh, this is, it's very family friendly, this game, but what they'll be asked to solve is a viral outbreak, not COVID, it's a virus that affects a group of reptiles. And so in order to solve uh, the problem and test this serum that will um, cure these animals of the virus, then you have to engage in a series of games. And so again, we're, we have firm dedication to understanding pub the public understanding of evolution, but now with this game type approach, there's just a whole new dimension to all the things that we can do with public audiences when we share this game. And so we partnered with um, the University of Kansas uh, in this effort. And so we'll be taking it to a number of locations, uh, including in the Midwest um, and in our state and some smaller libraries and science centers to do that. But as I march you through some of our different um, online resources, Understanding Science is a companion website to understanding evolution and focuses more broadly on the nature and process of science uh, and uh, really getting audiences to think about how science really works. And there's a central figure on the website that we call the How Science Works flowchart. And uh, it revolves around what's really the central pillars of, of science. So, you know, beyond this checklist of the scientific method, you know, science is inspired by exploration and discovery. 
and of course, testing ideas and formulating hypotheses. It benefits from community analysis and feedback, and the benefits and outcomes of science are really central to the importance of science. But with this How Science Works flowchart, it, the intentional uh, direction of the arrows here, you know, in multiple ways that feed in and out of these main concepts, uh, really embraces that science is not linear, it's iterative, and it's a community endeavor. Uh, and so with the five points that you see here, uh, there's important reminders as one is exploring the resources on this site uh, that you are part of a community uh, when you do science and that we are, rely on a system of checks and balances. Science uh, generally moves in a direction of greater accuracy and understanding, and the system is facilitated by greater diversity within the scientific community, you know, offering a broader range of uh, perspectives. And so we've used the how, how Science Works flowchart in a number of ways to draw attention to what scientific journeys are like and what's really going on behind the scenes when scientists propose new ideas. And so for us, you know, what better idea to share than the in Cretaceous extinction hypothesis connected with the asteroid impact? You know, a story that very much started at Berkeley uh, with the Alvarez team and uh, their collaborative group that proposed what was, a, you know, literally out of this world idea all those years ago. And so we plot this whole story. This is just one example of a case study on this website where we encourage the reader to take the journey, you know, that Walter Alvarez and others did. Now, you know, leading scientists in their field were still met with a lot of pushback and doubt when this idea uh, uh, first surfaced uh, in the early 80s. And so, but we use this as a way to just inspire people to think about not only their journey in science, but uh, scientific uh, endeavors in general. And we partnered with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute several years ago to build a interactive tool that allows one to plot really any journey in science. You're reading an article, you're diving into what the history was from a significant finding that you want to be able to graphically show. Um, you can even with this diagram in your own uh, lab groups and your individual research uh, really show, you know, what your pathway is in science that might be tied to, you know, a particular experiment uh, that that you're doing. And so and I um, highly encourage all of you to check out uh, this part of our website and this interactive feature. And what it allows you to do is with with click points and arrows and lines, you can trace the pathway that is uh, representing whatever experiment you're doing, whatever article you might be reading or um, scientific um, discovery that you're highlighting, then it allows you to just plot this course. And the nice thing about this tool, it's a great presentation tool because after you plot out however the flow of the science goes, whatever the history is, you can incorporate images, data tables, you know, whatever has motivated the research or whatever you address, uh, you can incorporate images to support that path and then you can export it in a PowerPoint and you've got a way to present uh, your mapping and journaling. So those kinds of tools are an example, again, of just trying to move beyond uh, what we've traditionally done with our, our web resources, which are great sources of information. But this way, uh, one can uh, really engage with the information in a manner that's more meaningful and that allows for broader and deeper communication about science to the general audience. And this is our most recent web resource, so we're not done yet when it comes to the Understanding Series, and we're certainly not done uh, when it comes to taking on uh, big uh, topics of our time. So we've done evolution, the nature and process of science, so bring on global change. And this is really a uh, unique, even more unique website than the others that I've shown so far, because we've focused this one uh, with visual aids and assets 
in a way that allows one to construct conceptual maps and show the interrelationships between the causes or drivers of global change, really understand how the Earth system works, and then to map out or illustrate the impacts, you know, the measurable changes in the impacts. So there are lots of features on this website. One can take a self-guided tour. Uh, it's appropriate for both informal and formal education. You know, and our goal in this work was to not only uh, allow or uh, support teaching and learning about global change in a way that focused not only on the causes and solutions to climate and environmental change, but that also uh, uh, enhances instruction because one can construct models to explain what drives global change. And this is a busy figure, but I show it to illustrate all the things you can do uh, with this Understanding Global Change website and the interactive tool that we have here that also was done in partnership with HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So with this, so this is a conceptual model of how sea level rise occurs uh, with the primary driver of burning fossil fuels. And so there are tools here. You can drag and drop a series of icons uh, that are related to causes of change, how the Earth system works, or measurable changes, drag them and drop them to this schematic figure. You can even change out the figure if you're working in Antarctica, a certain part of the Florida coast or the Gulf of Mexico. You can import an image of the area where you work, and then you can start to plot and move these icons and place them in a way that is central to the work that you're doing in global change. And then with click points and arrows in between, you can show, again, conceptually and, and through a system map of feedback loops, how these complex interact, interactions occur. And what we're excited about with this tool as well are the drop-down menus, explain and better highlight what all these steps are. And you can add notes and information in ways that make this a really great and presentable tool. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, just you know, feel free to screen uh, grab and capture uh, any of my images. And you know, we do hope that you um, can make your way to the websites. It's, it's great to do these. This global change interactive, in particular, is it's just a great addition to a lab activity or exercise as a supplement to a unit that um, one might be doing on earth systems or climate interactions. And so that we hope that um, you do enjoy some of these new tools. So let me move on to uh, another resource that uh, I'm directing that involves our fossil collections, uh, the digitization of, of fossils. Uh, there are large uh, grant opportunities these days for those of us working in biological collections and fossil collections to digitize more of our resources, uh, including the records, not only the fossil images themselves, but also all of the products that go along with maintaining a collection. So specimen records and um, locality and field data. So we've become the UCMP, uh, we're part of what the NSF calls a thematic collections network. And they're is a vast number of Cenozoic invertebrate fossils, you know, in dozens of museums that were not well cataloged. And so we joined forces with um, a dozen other museums, mostly along the West Coast, but also included the uh, Smithsonian in DC to compile, compile uh, records of um, fossil localities from the Eastern Pacific or basically the West Coast of the, U of the US you know, update taxonomy, um, modernize the record, excuse me, um, that we keep. Oh, excuse me, and, and share the data in a way that improves the public understanding of why we even hold on to, you know, all these fossils and what are they good for and who benefits and what can we learn? Um, and so I directed the broader impacts arm of this project, which included creating 
uh, virtual field experiences. So uh, capturing the field localities where these original collections were made. And what is it again that scientists do from the time they collect these fossils uh, to them making their way into the drawers of our museum and then sharing them with other scientists. So these virtual field experiences were started even pre-pandemic, but needless to say, uh, they've come to be even more valued by the community and we have really shaped them for pre-college classes, um, uh, nine through 12, high school mostly, but there are elements of this that are great even for elementary school. And so, you know, providing information on classic localities, demonstrating uh, how important these digital records are of the fossils in our drawers and all the associated information and really tying them into the next generation science standards practices. So these are uh, just some of the uh, field areas that are part of this exploration. And in my uh, really terrific conversation with the graduate students earlier today, you know, I was saying that I kept thinking I was going to leave research behind when I took on this role as an education director at a museum. But, you know, being at Berkeley and my still love of my own research in fossils, I have found my way to still being involved in research and asking some new questions about some of these fossil localities that we've long known about. And so one of the virtual field experiences is from an area where I would take my undergrads when I was a professor at SF State. It's in the Central Valley of California, you know, dry as a bone now, but uh, clearly this area of California was covered with water in the Pleistocene. Um, and there we've used gigapan photography, so a style of photography uh, with uh, billions of pixels of resolution that are just really terrific for sharing, you know, in what we call a, a story map here. So just as an example, um, here is a coin for scale uh, in this outcrop here taken with gigapan photography and that image blown up. And it does take a lot of um, stitching of thousands of images that result from the gigapan photography, but it's just terrific, uh, the quality of resolution that we can share in these virtual field trip resources. And then we can ask questions, you know, about the fossils that you see here that you totally would have missed, you know, from this scale of the outcrop. And so it really opened a door for us to share the science, share paleontology, share our collections um, and the digital products of all this work um, in a way that others can benefit for. And so our most recent uh, story maps, which Esri, the GIS folks, they've got a, a free resource uh, journal maps or story maps that are great for putting uh, data and images and text highlights into. And so we'll be debuting at the GSA meeting in Oregon next month, um, our most recent VFEs, which are from a section of Oregon, the Astoria Formation. So we're still working on these, but uh, it's been great to have that be part of our portfolio now. Um, in addition to, you know, the web resources that we've had for uh, years, you know, again, we're now developing new content. So um, let me end in just the uh, next uh, five minutes or so with community college partnerships that are part of these new and exciting directions that we're extending our science at the UCMP. And this work really was inspired by graduate students at the UCMP, one in particular, who's now a community, co community college faculty member uh, in Montana after finishing his doctorate last year. And he taught community college uh, in between his master's and his doctorate. And he kept asking me, why aren't we doing more with community colleges? And I really never had a good reason, you know, making excuses and everything. So he took it upon himself to start um, forming opportunities with community colleges in the Bay Area, this was before the pandemic, to bring classes of two-year college students to the museum for lab sections. So we would craft labs in paleontology that were consistent 
with some of the learning goals in that class. So, it, you know, if a paleo unit was planned in a geology class or a unit on evolution in a bio class, then we would provide that. So we came up with this name, Advancing Community College Education and Student Success. And post pandemic, um, we really didn't miss a beat because we began to use some of the digital resources from our different projects, all that great fossil imagery um, into a series of uh, virtual modules, of learning modules that could be delivered uh, in remote classes. But what's been so great about this project, even though I'm sure my initial excuse and response to why aren't we doing more with community college students is I'm doing too much already. I don't really have time, but after they initiated the graduate students, these first partnerships, uh, and we were able to get some seed money from the Paleo Society, and then later on from the NSF, it's just really been a terrific training ground um, for graduate students who really seek these kinds of leadership opportunities. So sorry, my pointer's going a little wacky here. Um, and the program has really been cost effective, especially in the last year and a half, uh, because we uh, are um, have mostly offered this remotely. So I'll just show you some examples of the transitions that we made um, during the pandemic, which was basically to take the lab uh, elements and transfer them to a virtual lab that the graduate students put together in Google Forms. So this is just a sample of two here. So, and we have them on a range of topics, um, paleobiology, which is mostly invertebrate paleo. We've got one on paleobotany. Uh, we also have some now on understanding science that uh, do focus on the nature and process of science. Uh, we've got one on deep time and vert paleo. Uh, in fact, the range of them now, and you can go ahead and um, and screen grab this, uh, but we've been really excited. The initial growth from access paleobiology and paleobotany now to evolution of the vertebrates and history of life. And we have one now on um, earth system science that uh, ties to our understanding global change website. And there have been lots and lots of benefits to growing the access polio program with this um, with these with the digital format and the digital resources and it just goes without saying you know the richness of opportunity uh, to share uh, the science of paleo um, in ways that really facilitate you know scientific inquiry and phenomena based learning is part of our next chapter and we were recently funded to develop a professional learning community with community college instructors to help with that inquiry and phenomena-based learning. And, and with these uh, digital learning resources, they can certainly be run at any institution. We've had some four-year institutions reach out to us as well. And so our initial partnerships with community colleges, which were based uh, only in the Bay Area, uh, has now grown to uh, 27 two-year colleges and half of them outside of California because once we begin posting these digital resources on some of the listservs that serve community college audiences then the feedback has really been great and has led to partnerships with with new colleges and you know if this graduate student hadn't asked me why aren't we doing more with two-year colleges then we probably never would have had this program so um, I certainly benefit tremendously uh, from all of the terrific ideas graduate students have. And it goes without saying, you know, working with community colleges uh, gives us opportunities to uh, really uh, meet uh, some of the student uh, demographic groups uh, directly. And um, we're able to uh, really uh, try to um, aid the community college resources. Uh, they're uh, resource needs uh, with this work and um, really attract some of the audiences that are important to us. So I'll just um, end with a couple of slides that capture a um, it's capture images from an article that was published in a series, uh, one issue of a series that AGU EOS did this past year and a half that uh, shines light on 
opportunities to really broaden the workforce, engage in diversity and inclusion in a different way. And uh, this group of authors made the argument that we should be reimagining the STEM workforce in a way that embraces the different pathways that people have um, as they enter the geosciences. And it's very different from the structured pipelines that uh, we were used to in like those initial articles that you would see about diversity. We'd always talk about the leaky pipeline. You know, everybody comes in the same way. And if you dare, you know, try to go in a different direction and not follow that pipeline path, then you just don't get counted anymore. You know, you leak out and you opt out. But in, you know, reimagining the STEM force as a braided river, then, you know, we embrace that there are multiple entries and exits to a career path in geoscience, informal STEM experiences, like the kind that we try to deliver uh, in museum settings are super important, you know, in working K through 12 education. And, you know, whatever path you come through in this braided river scheme, you can end up with a very inclusive STEM experience and a, and a workforce that's better mentored and supported. And there's so many strengths from other disciplines, as we know, the increasingly interdisciplinary aspect um, of our science should be celebrated. And we should uh, expect uh, particularly that, you know, our graduate programs and the graduate students that we mentor and supervise uh, have exposure uh, to uh, these pathways, to students, to undergraduates that might be coming, you know, from a different direction, but that are all in our classes. And, and so, respecting and recognizing and really embracing those differences, I think really enhances, you know, the, the whole of, of geoscience. And let's see, I think my last slide is, yeah, just a thanks to all the terrific people that I have the privilege of working with at the, the UCMP and uh, of course value all of the sources of, of support uh, that have come my way. And um, just happy to take, take some questions. So I will um, stop sharing. Let's see. Let me escape that. And um, we will go from there. Okay. Well, did I stop thank sharing? you. Oh. You did. Thank okay. you so much, Lisa, for that amazing talk. I'm going to open it up to questions. But first, okay. I just want to say that whoever thought of the escape room has a 14 year old child because my daughter would absolutely love that. And <sighs> it's just so cool. Um, but what I would like to do is open up questions to um, the students. And if you would just raise your hands, we're going to start with students and then move on to anyone else. Um, so raise your hand if you have a question or just jump in. Okay. Anyone? And Amelia, oh, okay. Yeah. Sam. And, yeah, and I may not be able to see every, okay, Sam, Samuel. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about um, kind of uh, a little more on the uh, community college and um, like the potential transition from community college to a four year position, because in my experience, I know that a lot of community college courses are not accepted at many four year universities and won't count as transfer credits. And this dissuades a lot of people from taking some of those community college courses, especially if um, they aren't the really large core classes and they might be some classes like uh, in the geosciences that don't have that many students or don't have as much support and they won't be recognized. Do you have any suggestions or plans to work with four-year colleges about, uh, or um, community colleges about those kinds of issues? Yes, because that has been a huge challenge for years are the articulation agreements or the lack of between the two-year and the four-year college, especially in, in disciplines that include geology and ocean and, and marine science, because 
there there's such the range, you know, of two year colleges and their ability to teach the kinds of classes that are required for a, a four year college degree, you know, in earth or, or marine science. And there have been students, you know, super excited when they take, you know, maybe their first earth science course at a two year. But when they look at the options for getting um, a full undergraduate science degree in that discipline at their local community college, there may be nothing, you know, there uh, or not the right sort of transfer agreement. So when when I was at San Francisco State and when I was department chair, we worked on some agreements with Bay Area, so San Francisco Bay Area community colleges to ensure that some of those transitions were better. And I'd say over the years, at least in our state, you know, there are all these commissions now and um, different levels of committees at both the universities of California, the California State Universities and the two years to work on just that, uh, because there is a, a an agreement now um, and really a rule that if a student has 30 units of credits from a two year college and uh, you know, they want to complete their science degree, they should be able to do it in two more years, you know, in in um, 120. Well, if they have 60 units, I guess, after two years, yet yeah, a community college, then they should be able to take those additional um, 60 units or two or three more years to 120 units at a four year. So there, there's still a lot of weak links and all that, though. But what's been um, nice and enjoyable for me to see uh, now that I'm getting more networked with the two-year college community in inner science and there's a big 2YC group at GSA is those sorts of discussions happen and it does take a lot of state level work though because there are so many differences of course in um, each of our states of how the agreements um, are ironed out between the two and four years but geoscientists really are leading the way in making sure that, yep, students who want to get a degree in our disciplines that start at a two year college can do it without, yep, too much delay. But it just it takes a lot of communication and coordination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dylan, I see you and your hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got that right. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. White, thank you for a wonderful talk. Sure. Um, at the beginning, you made a specific point that the culture of geoscience is starting to change and it comes down to us on the individual level to do, to really push that. Um, right. And then at the end of your talk, you mentioned this braided river model, which I think is rather powerful. How do you suggest that those of us in the audience bring up the braided river model in casual conversations, right. kind of you know, make that change in the geoscience community. Yes, there's there's been there've been a lot of this model sharing of how to do things differently. You know, after the pandemic within the pandemic and black lives, social justice and this sort of reawakening, uh, there are ways that, you know, I hope all of these movements inspire and that we're seeing, you know, groups publish on like that braided river and then, you know, the, the group that um, has the anti-racism approaches. So, but, but yeah, but a lot of the work starts, starts locally, you know, in, in departments, really asking questions, looking at how we advise and mentor, um, what kinds of opportunities we have for students who might be first generation or not as familiar with our science, you know, what practices do we have going on, you know, in our own individual labs and also in classrooms. And, you know, and I shared with the graduate students during our conversation earlier that every time I see an ad for a postdoctoral opportunity or an assistant professor faculty position, you know, as I'm writing letters for students uh, who are applying for their first prof professional positions, you know, they all require a diversity statement, um, uh, your perspectives on science communication and, and education outreach. And I know these are slow shifts 
in the culture of our departments, but we really should be encouraging graduate students to get some experience in that area because it matters, you know, when you apply for jobs. And so if you can, you know, be part of conversation groups and focus groups, I, there was an urge pod at Berkeley. I didn't participate in it, but I know that's one way departments have started that kind of cultural shift is just to have those real hard, difficult conversations about the way that we speak to each other and value or devalue individuals. And and so I don't recommend that, yeah, you, you know, you start a whole new group, but but you can, um, you know, bring forth ideas, I think, um, to departments in a way that is consistent with really what we're trying to do. And and I had um, one of the images I had in a slide where I talked about some of the programs that I'm part of uh, said, you know, vision and change in geoscience. So there's an AGI publication by that title, Vision and Change, that um, folks at the Jackson School of Geoscience headed, but I was part of. And so in that, there are a whole range of recommendations of ways to make this shift. Now, some of it's truly rooted in just are the academics of, you know, we still need to teach, you know, the core classes that we do, but there are ways of delivering that uh, core instruction that is conducive to students with different abilities and to using technology and thinking of maybe alternatives to the classic field work. So that's a good resource too, that vision and change. And just, I think, continually asking ourselves, you know, are we preparing people for 21st century jobs and for communicating and working, you know, across all of the diversity gradients that, you know, are part of the, the modern world. Excellent. Well said. Thank you very much okay. for the detail sure. and thank you for your yeah. contribution. Okay, thank you. I have the um, braided river all over my- Yes, that braid- When I had an office door, it, it got on there and I love it. I absolutely love it. Yep, when I first saw that article, I thought, okay, this has so much value. Um, and just seeing the way, yeah, that they made that analog to a lot of the ways, yeah, we should be thinking about, um, you know, advising and yeah, and recommending students to, to follow their career path. I have somebody who has her hand raised who is teaching a professional development class in our college. And I think she would probably love to ask a question. Okay, is that Maya? Maya. Hi, Maya. Hi, Lisa. Thank you. That was a great seminar. And I'm, I'm so excited about so many avenues and therefore a little embarrassed that what I'm going to ask you is about semantics, but I think it's important. So you started, you know, with talking about Jedi and be a Jedi. Yes. I also noticed that you, you know, you use the term BIPOC in your seminar. And yes, I just yesterday, there was an article that I saw in Scientific American about um, how the term Jedi is kind of problematic for, for DEI efforts. Okay. And I, and I don't know, you know, like, know that we need to get into the weeds, but I think part of the problem with having these hard conversations like you were just telling Dylan about is that people are actually unsure of what language to use. And that's going to be highly dependent on, you know, each individual and their background and, and their space and what, what they prefer and what they're most comfortable with. How do you recommend kind of getting past not having the right words right. into getting into the conversation? Okay. I appreciate your question. It's a great one. And there are times in talks where I do away with some of the acronyms and just talk about what it means to meaningfully engage, you know, a broader spectrum of individuals because we when when the terms when the term Jedi, you know, initially surfaced and even be a Jedi, it almost made light of the effort and seem to minimize, you know, the importance and seriousness of how you truly, you know, increase diversity and manage equity and um, yes, how these, what these terms really translate to when you're trying to do the work. 
and and yes, there and and some folks aren't comfortable, you know, using BIPOC and it just, you know, it lumps a whole lot of people together. And what if you're not a member of that group? Does that mean that you can't really have discourse around um, folks of color or folks, you know, within that group? So what I have found myself doing more is there was a figure I showed from a paper on action steps for anti-racism had like a polygon and it had, you know, equity and justice and inclusion. And then it was color coded and there was a, a tip, you know, or an action item di directly related to equity or diversity. It's like that to me is so valuable because it helps explain, you know, what we mean when we say identity and then how do we move to, uh, improve and incorporate and acknowledge the role of identity and everything that we do. Um, and so, uh, no. oh, I'm sorry, everyone. I'm helping my mom <laughs> today. So, and, and yeah, I probably have to go in about a minute. Um, yes. So my, thank you for that. And I really, I, I might even just start my, um, yeah, start my talks with that one figure that just breaks it all down and doesn't use so many acronyms and, um, yeah, well, clear. that wasn't a criticism okay. of you okay. at, yeah. at all. Um, <laughs> okay. it, it's just, I feel like sometimes we get stuck in the language and not knowing the right language and that actually right. prevents us from having the hard okay. conversation. Well, and I think but. the our diversity and inclusion um, committee that's just forming actually had that conversation in committee yesterday based mm -hmm. on what I overheard in the other half of my house. <laughs> Um, but for those of you, I know Lisa has to go, and so we should say thank you. Um, and thank you, Maya. Um, I didn't mean to yes. cut you off, um, but I know you need to go, Lisa. I will actually put a link to that article okay. in the Teams um, so you don't have to worry about it, and that okay. we have access to that figure that you actually um, showed. So okay. with that, can we all open up our mics and thank Lisa for a wonderful seminar and I wish it was in person so we could hang Me out too. more. <laughs> I know. Well, thank you. I hope we'll see thank you in the invitation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And, and please reach out. I, time went by so fast, but Maya, if, if I can ever, you know, have a conversation with your lab group or department, I'd be more than happy to and others that may have questions please do reach out. So we're going to be fighting Excellent. for you. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, so Amelia, for inviting much. me. All right. Everybody have a great weekend. And uh, go help your mom. I will. Okay. <laughs>